So thank you very much to the organisers of this event for inviting us to speak. And I'm sorry that we look like we're half asleep, but it is the morning in, uh, in the UK. Uh, speak Up for Women in New Zealand have demonstrated throughout their entire campaign their commitment to human rights for all people and for all individuals who have all forms of protected characteristics. And it's been really to all of us in the UK, in Canada, in Australia and beyond, instrumental to see how much that engagement has paid off. I'm particularly impressed that the MP, Louisa Wall, not only attended tonight, but also spoke at this event, and that so many different voices have been represented, listened to and engaged with, because it's only through that that we will come to solutions that uphold the human rights of all individuals concerned without erasing the human rights of any of those individuals. The announcement at the beginning of this week that there will be a greater public consultation in New Zealand is one that I think we all should celebrate because the public, all of us as individuals, have a stake in what's going on in terms of women's rights, and in terms of the rights of transgender individuals who are some of the most vulnerable people in our communities and populations. Those public consultations will enable expertise from a broad range of areas, evidence-based analysis to be able to be brought to individuals across all communities and be able to be discussed in a way that is reasonable and respectful and seek solutions to uphold the human rights of all people. The expertise that I can bring and that my colleague Julian can bring is an expertise on law. And I will begin by framing this talk in terms of international human rights law and Julian will then turn to the national human rights law and how national human rights and national laws impact upon all individuals. International human rights law began after the horrors of Nazi Germany. Now, those horrors of Nazi Germany were the fact that a government could do anything to individuals over which they controlled and that there would be no international law repercussions, whether they killed them, tortured them, repressed them, put them into gas chambers, expelled them or anything else. While those kind of horrors had been going on throughout colonial history for many hundreds of years, when those horrors were brought to the shores of Europe, the world rose up and said, never again should the weak individual have no recourse against the big and powerful state. And so in 1945, at the end of the Second World War and after the horrors of Nazi Germany, the United Nations was created and the United Nations said, we will create a declaration of human rights that all of us hold by virtue of being born human. Those fundamental rights belong to all of us, no matter what. And this is in, within that framework of international human rights law that I want to talk. When the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which set out the fundamental rights that all of us hold by virtue of being born human, was created, there was a big conversation about whether vulnerable groups, and particularly at that time women, should have specific rights given to them because they were oppressed, subjugated, or in any other way had their rights taken away from them by the societies in which they lived. And at that time, the countries, which were only about a quarter of the countries that exist today, said no. From an idealist perspective, we ought to think about those human rights as being given to every human being, no matter what their vulnerable or protected characteristics are. But it became clear very quickly that women were going to continue to be subjugated and depressed and other vulnerable minorities within countries would be subjugated and oppressed by virtue of their specific vulnerabilities. So, 
Within the first few years of the Universal Declaration being declared in 1948, the United Nations said we need to have specific mechanisms to protect women and to create mechanisms that will protect the specific vulnerabilities that women faced that were beyond the vulnerabilities of anyone else. And over a 20 year period, those specific vulnerabilities were looked into and were addressed in international law and international mechanisms. And because of that, we now have specific mechanisms to protect children, people with disabilities, people, people of racial minorities, people from all forms of other backgrounds, where their backgrounds might make them more vulnerable to human rights abuses than the average straight white male. What we're looking at today, and what we're looking at generally in the world, is this idea that on the one hand, women are marginalized, oppressed, and subjugated. That violence against women is a massive problem across all forms of societies. And also at the same time, that gender identity minorities or transgender individuals are also a vulnerable group who experience all sorts of marginalization, discrimination, and oppression in terms of their fundamental human rights. We all, as people from vulnerable groups, and particularly the people who are sitting in this room today, understand the need for us all to step up and speak up for the fundamental rights of all individuals, and that includes transgender individuals. What we've seen at the United Nations level and at the international human rights law level since 1948 and the Universal Declaration is that there have been many moves towards trying to stop discrimination and violence and oppression against women. And that has led to moves to stop discrimination, violence and oppression against any other vulnerable groups, whether they are older persons, whether they are people from racial or ethnic minorities, whether they are people of religion and so on. We need to continue to fight together to stop the oppression and subjugation of those minorities. What we don't need to be doing is to be fighting against one another. In international human rights law, it's very clear what a woman is. A woman is defined as being female, as having female chromosomes, gonads and genitalia. In the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, women are defined in terms of the sex class. Now over recent decades, the idea of sex and gender have been discussed at great length in terms of Western European and other countries. But there are 77 countries in the world out of 193 UN member states that still criminalize, discriminate against, kill or torture people who identify in some way that does not conform with gender norms, whether that's sexual orientation or whether that's their gender identity. In 1998, when the International Criminal Court was established, it spoke about the gender-based violence and gender-based crimes, and it defined gender as two sex classes, male and female. One of the key issues that we're facing in terms of sex and gender is how do we define the two issues? What we see both at national levels in terms of law and at international levels in terms of understandings is that sex is about chromosomes, genitalia and gonads. All of us ought to be fighting for anyone to have a gender identity that they would like to be able to present their gender in any way that they like, but not to be conflating sex and gender as the same thing. We've seen recently in January that New Zealand has had its universal periodic review, which is the same review that every country has from the Human Rights Council every four and a bit years from its peer group to discuss its human rights records and what it can do better on human rights. 
11 of the recommendations made were around sex and gender, around the pay gap between males and females, around the gap between how many males versus how many females are sitting on boards, around the issues to do with education and males and females. The fight around what we need to do for female children and for female adults has not gone away. No matter whether we are a Western European country or whether we are a country from another region. We all need to be fighting also for transgender individuals because those individuals face all sorts of discrimination and violence in all countries, including our own. What we need to be doing is looking at the different protected characteristics that Julian will talk to in her part of the talk. We need to be looking at them not as being the same as one another, but as separate and how we can all fight to make sure that there is no discrimination and there is no violence and there is no state condoned human rights abuses against any of these individuals. And how can we uphold the human rights of all people concerned?